Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me and see me all right? Yes. 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 Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's been lovely to be chatting before the service. If you want to carry on chatting, we're going to be meeting again for coffee at 11.30 after the service. Just use the same link, come back into the same uh, virtual room, and we can catch up properly with the coffee after the service. So please do. Just a quick reminder, you are being recorded, I hope, um, now. So uh, if you don't want to appear on screen later, don't appear on screen now. Uh, but I hope you will appear so that we can show yeah, the world we're not. The church that we are. It's lovely to be with you. And firstly, a massive thank you to Vanessa Bird for doing our talk on viruses last Saturday. Very timely, very informative. Uh, and I hope to, they'll be doing further Saturday morning talks with Vanessa again in the future. <coughs> Now this Sunday in the lectionary is called the second Sunday before Advent. And of course, that's quite right. Chronologically, it is two weeks until Advent Sunday when Christopher will be preaching for us. But I think to call it the second Sunday before Advent is to do it a bit of a disservice because actually we are in a season in its own right. Advent is when we think about the coming of Jesus the first time when he was born. Lots of candles. But this season in which we are now is more of a, an apocalyptic season. And apocalypse doesn't mean destruction in the modern sense. Apocalypse means unveiling, the unveiling of God's plan for the return of Jesus. And that culminates next week in the festival of Christ the King. And it always interests me that we do tend um. to gloss over that part of the story. We get very excited about Christmas because of all the things that go along with Christmas. But actually, of course, Christmas, in one sense, has already happened. But what we're looking forward to now is the winding up of the story, the coming of Christ again. That's the thing that lies in our futures. And that's what this season is all about. So the readings from morning prayer and evening prayer for the last couple of week, weeks have been very apocalyptic. The readings for today are, and of course, the readings next week are about that return of Christ. So Christmas for us is still two seasons away. It's this apocalyptic season and Advent to go before we get to Christmas. So don't just spend all your time looking forward to Christmas, however that looks at the moment. Dwell in this season and let's prepare ourselves not just for the coming of Christ as a baby, but for the return of Christ as King. It's lovely to be with you all this morning. Do we have our first reader and our intercessor present with us this morning? Yes. And, and uh, is both here, marvellous, thank you. In which case we can start. And so we meet this morning in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We are mute to pray together. Sorry, we are muted to pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we take a moment of quietness to bring to God's mind those times this past week we've not lived up to his calling on our lives. Let's take a moment. And so let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed 
through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say together, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. And so let us pray. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son was revealed to destroy the works of the devil and to make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that we, having this hope, may purify ourselves even as he is pure, that when he shall appear in power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading. Sorry, I forgot we were muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. The first reading is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them, suddenly, as labour pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. The man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said. You entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who'd received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put, a, should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And so may I speak this morning in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but there's a t-shirt available which expresses in a very succinct way the message that it's possible to take from this morning's reading. The t-shirt says, look busy, Jesus is coming. Now, of course, it's meant as a joke, but it contains an important truth about our faith as well as a significant misunderstanding. The important truth is that God in the person of Jesus is coming and that with Jesus comes judgment, especially judgment about how we've lived our lives in response to the gospel. And that judgment has consequences which last for eternity. In this postmodern era in which all values are relative and no values are absolute, the image of Jesus as judge is not one that receives much prominence or even much credence, even in the church. And if I'm being brutally honest with myself, that our image is not one that features at the forefront of my theology on a day-to-day -day basis. However, the concept of Jesus returning to judge the world is not limited to just a few passages of the Bible and of interest only to the Hellfire and Brimstone Brigade. It is in fact one of the central tenets of our faith and one that we repeat each week in the words of the Nicene Creed. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Now, 
If you are told that someone is coming to see you, it's not unnatural to ask when. If Vivian and I have someone coming over for dinner, which of course we don't anymore for obvious reasons, we like to know when they are coming. So firstly, we can make sure we have some food ready. And secondly, so we can try and make the place look a bit respectable. So if Jesus is coming back, when is it going to happen? That was a question which exercised the early church a great deal as the first disciples believed it would be during their lifetimes. <clears throat> and when that didn't happen, the church had to work out what it meant to be a church in waiting, a church which exists between the first coming of Christ, which we'll be celebrating at Christmas, and the parousia, or the return of Christ. This led to two main answers that we saw in today's readings, and which we also see elsewhere in the New Testament. The first answer, is that it's futile to try and guess when the second coming will happen. It will happen in God's time. And put simply, God does not work to our timetable. As it says in Psalm 90 at verse four, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Some churches, not Anglican ones in the main, do spend an inordinate amount of time trying to work out and then announce the exact time and date of Christ's return. But of course, those dates pass and the followers get disillusioned and Christianity as a whole is slightly embarrassed by the whole activity. As it said in the reading from 1 Thessalonians, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And the second answer to the church's question is that because we don't know when it will be, we have to remain watchful and faithful at all times that will be judged at least in part on the extent to which we've continued the work which has been entrusted to us. Importantly, we should also not lose sight of the fact that whether or not Christ returns to judge the world during our physical lifetimes is actually a matter of supreme unimportance. Because if the return of Christ does not happen for a hundred thousand years, a million years, or when the sun expands to <clears throat> eat up the whole solar system in a few billion years, as far as each of us are concerned, we will experience the moment of judgment after our own death. And of course, like the return of Christ, the moment of death is likely to come as a thief in the night without making an appointment. As it also says in Psalm 90 verse 12, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. But what are we to do whilst waiting for the day that we meet Christ, whenever that will be? Or well, whilst the parable should always be handled with great care, perhaps we are given some parabolic hints in the gospel reading this morning. As we heard, the owner of three slaves, actually he probably owned many slaves, but the owner of the three slaves we're talking about was going away on a long journey. But he knew that he would be coming back and he wanted his wealth to increase whilst he was gone. So he gave his money to each of the three of them to invest and to grow. Now, whilst those men are described as slaves, they're obviously not the menial laborers that we may associate with that word but rather they are obviously highly trusted stewards as the sums involved are surprisingly large. In today's translation, they were called bags of gold, but actually, of course, we may well think of them as talents. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The average day's wage for a laborer in Roman era Judea <clears throat> was one drachma. One drachma equaled one mina, and there were 60 minas in a talent. That means that one talent was equivalent to 6,000 days or 16 years wages for a laborer. And the most senior of the three slaves we heard about was entrusted with five bags of gold or five talents, which would have been 82 years wages. We're not quite talking about a rollover jackpot on the national lottery, but we are talking about a very large sum of money. And the slave owner wanted that money to be wisely invested whilst he was gone. As we heard, the first two slaves kept themselves busy and they both doubled their master's money while he was away. We're not told exactly how long he was away for, but 100% return is good in anyone's book. The master 
congratulated and rewarded the industrious slaves, saying they will have charge of even greater things and can now enter into the joy of their master. However, of course, the third slave failed in the task given to him. He simply dug a hole in the ground and put 16 years of someone's salary into it, and then later simply handed it back to his master without even receiving any interest on it. And this man was deemed a worthless slave, and his investment fund of one talent was handed over to the more productive fund manager, and the worthless slave was thrown out of the household into the outer darkness. Now, on one level, the moral of this parable is easily accessible. If we use the gifts that God has entrusted us with wisely, then those gifts will increase and we can offer that growth back to God and we will share in the joy of our master by entering into the kingdom of heaven. Conversely, if we bury and neglect our gifts out of fear or laziness, then we will have no part of the kingdom as we have done nothing to increase the kingdom. Given the message of this parable, it's easy to see where the Jesus is coming, look busy mentality comes from. And we can probably all be sometimes guilty of thinking that the more we do, the more acceptable we make ourselves to God. Of course, the point is it's not simply about looking busy, nor, it, nor is it even about being busy for the sake of busyness. God is not fooled by our outward appearances, or by any good works that are motivated out of making ourselves look good. Rather, God looks first and foremost at the motives of our hearts. If we live every day in, a gen in the genuine expectation of meeting Christ and in the knowledge that any moment could be our last before we face judgment, then I believe that the constant contemplation of the reality of Christ in our day-to-day -day lives will transform our hearts and that purified hearts will lead inevitably to a transformation of our actions and our motives. Our desire to put God's gifts to good use by loving actions towards others will then become a fruit of our ongoing salvation and not the cause of our future salvation. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite fit so easily onto a t-shirt. I said a moment ago, that we need to treat the parables with some caution as they are not meant to provide straightforward answers. Or if we think they are giving us a straightforward answer, we're probably not asking the right question. It is easy if we're not careful to form the impression that the return of Jesus is coming at an unexpected time in order to catch us out, in order to cast us out. I don't think that God wants to jump scare us. I believe that God's greatest desire is for us all to enter into his glory. And that is why we are told constantly to be diligent and to be vigilant. As it said in the Thessalonians reading this morning, read by Julian, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Oh, man. And so we affirm our faith together in the words of the creed, looking out for the return of Jesus in those words and taking them to heart. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And so let us pray. Let us pray for the church and for the world and thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Dear Lord, on this second Sunday before Advent, we ask you to protect us and your worldwide church with the whole armour of faith. Equip us, we pray, with the breastplate of faith and love that we read about today in the book of Thessalonians so that we can stand against the evils of our time. And with that helmet of hope and salvation, together with the different talents and gifts that you have given us, may we be loyal and effective in bringing your kingdom a little nearer. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Dear Lord, may your kingdom come to the many places of strife in the world where struggles continue but no longer fill the headlines. We pray for the dispossessed, grieving and injured, and for all those who work for peace. We give thanks for all those who work behind the scenes to bring about an end to war and oppression. We pray that your spirit of peace will fill those in authority with a new resolve to use their power and authority for the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, okay. Dear Lord, with the continuing battle and effects of COVID-19 here in Hadlow, the UK and the wider world, we pray for those who are vulnerable. We think of those who have contracted the virus and pray that they make a full recovery. We pray for those whose jobs are insecure and those who have lost their incomes and are struggling to feed their families. We pray for the younger generation whose future can so easily look bleak. May they find comfort and strength in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah. yeah, our prayer. We pray for all who work in the medical profession and those who work behind the scenes supporting them, all essential for us living through this difficult time. And we pray for all who are working on the new vaccine to combat COVID-19 and that it will be a success. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah, our prayer. prayer. Dear Lord, may your kingdom come to people in need. We pray for the homeless and the disadvantaged. We pray for those who are lonely, lonely because COVID-19 has kept them isolated from friends and family, lonely because they have no family, lonely because they have lost a partner, lonely because no one seems to care, those who are lonely because of handicap or illness. Let your presence be with all those who are alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our community of Hadlow and all who live in Moneypenny Close and Warren Gardens. And in the hustle and bustle of our village, we ask that your still small voice would clearly be heard and that we would find blessings for us and for all those who are searching to make sense of this earthly life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear yeah, our prayer. Dear Lord, may your kingdom come to those who suffer in body, mind and spirit. We, pay, we pray for friends and family who are ill at this time. We pray for Jonathan, Rob, Tony and his wife. We bring them to you in the confidence that you love them and know their every need and that your healing power is still the same today. Bless all that is being done for their recovery and answer our prayers as you see best. 
we remember those who have departed from your world, including those from our Book of Remembrance. We pray for Godfrey Irving Howe, Raymond Kenneth Walter, Diana Jones, Marjorie Smith, and Mark Pepper. And in a few moments of silence, we remember them and anyone known to us who needs our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, in amongst all this uncertainty, unusualness and concern, we praise you that you are the same Lord. And we give thanks that we can appreciate the beauty of the earth, the sky and sea, for the richness of our countryside with its bird song and wildlife. We thank you for these wonderful gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. And finally, in the words of a hymn by William Cooper, here may we prove the power of prayer to strengthen faith and sweeten care to teach our faint desires to rise and bring all heaven before our eyes. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the, the sake of your Son, our Savior, our Savior Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Stafford, for leading our prayers, and thank you, Julia, for doing our first reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you may have seen from this week's Pew News, we're always on the lookout for more people to get involved both in reading and interceding. So if you feel called that you may be able to do either of those, please do let myself or Janice know. If you're worried about what it means to be an intercessor, I'm very happy to talk that through with you. Full training will be provided. But the more we do together, the more we can be the church in this place. So let's all unmute now for the peace. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you, Sasha. Peace be with you, Justine. Peace be with you, Christine. And you. Ruth and Simon, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Max. Peace be with you, Lisa. Peace be with you, Anne. Peace be with you, Sylvia and Morris. Peace be with you, Lisa. Hello, this is Morris. Hello. I've, I've had an op this morning I had an this morning I had an operation at Maidstone Hospital to strengthen the power of my right eye. Happily it all went well. Great. Uh, the fact that, uh, Good. Um, Good. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Morris. Well done. 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 And, and also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them, them to the, the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right that you give thanks. Give thanks. <clears throat> Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Lord our God, you prepare a table before us. And although we cannot be physically present at your holy Eucharist, by your grace, open our hearts to receive the gift of your Son, the Word made flesh, and send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which he shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence, his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people. Gather us in your loving arms and bring us with Saint Mary and all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. And we pray together. Excuse me. We pray together. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, that, though separated by distance, we may still, through faith, 
be partakers in the benefits of Christ's offering of his body and his blood. This we ask through the same Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And so I take communion physically this morning. But I take it on behalf of you watching. I take it on behalf of all our congregation not watching this morning. I take it on behalf of all Christians fasting from communion today. For though I take communion physically, I do pray that you make your spiritual communion with God now. Let's take a minute. Gracious Lord, in this holy sacrament, you give substance to our hope. Bring us at the last to that fullness of life for which we long, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. And let's unmute to pray together. Almighty God, God, we thank, we thank you for being here, either physically or spiritually, with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit, the living word of praise and glory. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you now and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Let us go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. It's been good doing church, even in these strange times. At least you get to keep to stay in the dry and warm. It'd be lovely to talk to you, some of you again at 11.30. Otherwise, I may well speak to some of you during the week. Have a good week. God bless. God bless. Bye, Bye. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.